this is the kind of stuff that can happen. You've got to be extremely careful. Not on a smaller diameter so much. That 12.5% is probably not going to haunt you, but anything greater than 8 inch, it will come back, come back to bite you. So just letting folks know that the thicknesses that are in fact published are not necessarily true. Probably something that will have to be addressed in the next few years, but the manufacturing techniques today are vastly improved from what they were 40 years ago, but the industry standards have allowed this uh, to continue. So let's talk about connections for a minute, what type of um, connections we want to put our product together with, whether we're going to go to threaded, whether you know, standard eight round that's used primarily in, in both the water well as well as the oil and gas industry, or like an F480, a flush thread, or whether we're not going to go to a weld or a plain square end or exterior, exterior uh, weld collar, we've got a weld collar right here being made up, or whether we go to a wire lock or some of the groove and screw tech, groove and screw tech connections. Now here's something that I really want to emphasize from the standpoint. This was something I learned in the very first week that I went to work in the oil patch, and that was, yeah, pipe dope only the pins. Pipe dope's insoluble, and if we're looking at a well where we're putting a great deal on, and again, pipe dope's real inexpensive, but the simple fact is that over usage over time really can build up against the formation. So if I can make an emphasis to you to take back to your crews and to the folks in the field, pipe dope only the pins on our completions. We'll use a lot less material and we'll have a lot less circulated back down around into the formations. And again, since the stuff's insoluble, we'll be hard pressed to get it back out. Now we talked a little bit earlier about directionally drilled wells and I've had a few folks say, well what's the big deal? You know, what would, what would make anybody want to directionally drill a well? Well this day and age, with the limited amount of conductors they have on a platform, they just can't simply go straight down. And they have to know where in fact they're drilling. It typically is the analogy of a spider from the standpoint of going out. Uh, the other example is that um, Saddam Hussein used the excuse of invading Kuwait by stating that the, Ku the Kuwaitis were directionally drilling onto his territory. And that was a reason and justification for him invading Kuwait back in the 90s. So, Today, the automation and stuff has allowed us to go ahead and basically drill around obstacles and find those formations that are most beneficial. And it basically helps us reduce the risk and increase the uh, 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 potential for uh, complex well completions. We can lower our drilling costs, we can improve the well productivity, and we get a better overall management of the reservoir. Again, what we talked about earlier from the standpoint of some of the earlier completions that were done in the 18, 1900s was that we basically drilled wells and allowed them to flow. If we don't manage some of these, re these reservoir pressures, we're never going to get some of the resources out. We're not going to get close to 70% of production. So what we're trying to do here is, in fact, manage that reservoir, whether we're injecting or extracting, and basically utilize some of the uh, advancements that we have in uh, directional drilling. Now, measurement while drilling, I touched on that a little bit earlier, but it's basically directional drilling, and we now have a means of knowing exactly the orientation of that drill bit. It is a phenomenal advancement from the standpoint of knowing if we've got a bedded sand of 90 feet, we can sickle along that for two, three, four thousand feet. There are wells that are being completed off the coast of California which are setting 6,000 feet of screen in a 90 foot uh, sand. They had drilled through that sand for 20 years simply because they didn't have the technology to make that right hand curve and drill out as far as they were able to. But today, with the advent of the directional drilling and measurement well drilling, they know exactly where that sand lays, they can get right into the middle of it. And these wells may cost $3 million, but they get returned back in 90 days. So uh, this is the kind of advancements that we could be looking at ourselves. And the next is, in fact, the bottom hole logging. This particular tool right here now has, this is again a bottom hole assembly with the drill bit below the operator, but it now gives us an opportunity to measure temperature and SP and get a formation phase. We can do a great deal from the standpoint of what we're looking at right behind the bit to see whether or not this is something we want to continue with or whether or not we want to move out. So the advancements that we have now give us you know, optimal features. We can figure out what the weight on our bit and the orientation, what type of pressures and such. But some of the advancements that are coming along today are going to be readily available to the water well industry. We'll be able to start seeing some of the stuff ourselves. And maybe perhaps in the next few years we won't have to worry about a drill stem test. We won't have to take a zone sample. We may be able to let this bottom hole assembly do the work for us. Now, coil tubing is something I'm not sure if many of you folks are familiar with it. It's a recent um, recent introduction to the water well industry. This is actually on a job site in Orange. In fact, we've got a representative from the Orange County Water District here. But uh, this is actually on a job site in Orange County, California. This is an actual coil tubing unit which is set up over a well in a very busy street. It had been a bean field 10 years before, but just as the nature of the urban development in some of the uh, southwest, We've now got homes all around us, and we now have eight hours to work on these particular wells. 
these wells are extremely challenging from the standpoint that since we got to get in, we can only work on them for a very limited amount of time, set up MOVE and DMOVE was in fact critical. Coil tubing played perfectly into this. And again, this technology has been around for 20, 25 years in the oil and gas industry and is just now being available because of surplus equipment and such, and operators willing to get into the oil and the water oil industry. But it's a continuous reel of pliable steel. This is the uh, uh, armature that runs the material in and out of the well. But we can now set up readily over a well. I mean, it's 15, 20 minutes. We can fill the well to surface. We can run to bottom. We can circulate clean. We can trip out. We can set up our high pressure nozzles and jet wash. And we can do that in less than an hour. So the coil tubing comes in various diameters. 1.66 is the most common. You can get it up to 2 and 3 eighths. And I think you can actually get up to 3 and a half inch now. But it's a pliable, continuous reel of, of steel that is set up on a reel. And depending, again, upon your depth and your requirements and such, whatever you need to do to, to work over a given well. So you've got the reel, you've got the running apparatus, and you've got a triplex pump right here. You can run in electric submersible pumps if you're willing to go ahead and jet, so you can go ahead and extract material. But this gives us the versatility that we've never had before in regards to working over a well and getting in and off a well in record time. You can run in open-ended, you can run in with a high-pressure jetty, and you can exceed 1,000 PSI working pressures. The triplex pump and the, and the coil tubing is I think, rated to a 5,000 PSI working pressure. But you can run in open-ended, circulate the bottom, come back out. This high-pressure spinning nozzle is back on it within 20 minutes, ready to go, and you're running back down the well with a with drive head assembly charging away. So coil tubing is something that, is, again, is an oil and gas, stand, or an oil and gas standard but it's something that more and more operators, I think, can take advantage of. Um, this one particular operator in California met with a great deal of resistance because he was not a drill. He was actually an oil and gas uh, operator who had seen the light in regards to introducing this technology to the Waterwell Group, and a lot of the Waterwell contractors basically fought him tooth and nail. But the advantages were so distinct that they now have an opportunity and uh, have the op options of now having this made available to them. And the coil tubing now is an advancement that's being utilized in underbalanced drilling. Instead of allowing our hydrostatic pressures to go ahead and dictate what we're doing to the formation, we're now able to go back in with these slim coil tubing apparatuses and with flapper valves to drill in, drill and ream a given produced interval or production interval and come back out and never allow the full hydrostatic pressure to, to uh, um, touch that formation. So the operator is able to go ahead and see exactly what's going on. He's able to do the drilling control. He's able to go ahead and sense exactly what's going on, but he's also able to do all the diagnostics and all under an underbalanced environment. So this slim hole type application, many would argue, well, we're not going to get the kind of production. But with under reaming and efficiencies in these wells, we have opportunities now of getting very prolific producers out of very slim hole production. And again, the underbalance is, in fact, one of the um, advancements in the last seven to ten years have been utilized in the oil and gas industry to a great deal of success. And since we don't do a great deal in the oil and gas industry on development, we spend a great deal of time on making sure that we limit our skin and we're taking a look at some of the different types of um, screens that are out there. I've got I brought along a couple of oil and gas screen samples that you probably have never seen before. But I thought it made for interesting fodder from the standpoint that these are much finer wires. These are protective shrouds. Careful, Thomas. Thank you. This was a uh, survey that was actually done in the North Sea. Since the API allows for so much interaction, we're actually able to go in and interview operators and try to find out exactly what their interests are. What are some of their hot points? What are some of the areas that they're really looking to try to go and get addressed? So this was a survey. They wanted a robust screen. They wanted something that could basically eliminate any running damage. We put a shroud on the screen. They wanted minimal plugging, so they wanted to really control their liquid as well as their solid fine removals, and they wanted erosion control. Some of these wells have five, 10,000 PSI pressures on them. Once they set complete these wells, they don't ever want to have to go back and touch them. So they're going to the next degree. They're going to some of the advancements in high wear wires, high wear materials and stuff, so that they get these wells to develop up more readily, but they also get these wells to last the period of time that you're looking at. These are all um, Gulf of Mexico as well as North Sea, long reach uh, horizontal completions that may very well have as much as two or 3,000 feet of screen in them. And again, they want a, a strong filter or a, a, an edge type filter because some of the meshes that they've worked with have in fact given them in, uh, indications of flooding. So 
It's interesting that because of, again, the API, you have an open forum where your operators are able to go ahead and, and basically give you their two cents from the standpoint of what they want from the standpoint of a uh, long life, durable, maintenance free type screen completion. And again, some of the samples that are being passed around, some of the uh, centered materials that have been around where actually a stainless steel material is, is uh, pressed in, it's centered, some of the advancements on some of the three packs, and then some of the other just dual screen type completions that are utilized. And again, stuff that you may not necessarily see in a water well industry, but I want to pass them around for, for consideration. And compared to our conventional water well sand screens, the construction of any well screen really affects the development and the energy that we can apply to that. They utilize the same type of efficiencies and the same type of thought in the oil and gas industry as we do in the water well industry, trying to go and get the most open area in any one type of spring completion so we get the best bang for a buck. And I have no idea what that is like that. <clears throat> I basically wanted to go and demonstrate that sand control is in fact an issue in, in any of our industries, whether it be water well or oil and gas. This was um, two two-inch holes that were actually perforated, if you can imagine, in an existing liner that had failed. The operator ran a wire at screen. This was a pretty rigorously built screen. This is a um, quarter-inch wire, and it's a 304 stainless steel. The sucker lasted less than a week. This is a quarter-inch rod right here, quarter-inch rod right here, and this is all from what we call impingement or abrasion or just simple sand uh, production. We were able to wash out a screen that was very stout, and I think it's rather interesting to see the gravel that's been, been forced into it as well. But the simple fact is that sand control in the water well industry is just as paramount a problem as it is in the oil and gas industry. So is that mixture taken from the inside? Or is it's actually, we extracted the, it was an inner liner, we extracted the screen and took a picture of it. The contractor was mad at me. That's it. I, I didn't do that, I swear. Anyway, here's a twist. This is something that came out of a, an old Baker uh, brochure. I'd never seen it before, but I thought I'd go and throw it in here for grins and giggles. Here's a twist. You actually would gravel pack your formation and there are auger flights welded onto the screen assembly, and you, you basically twist your screen in. I'd never seen that done before. Now, you probably have some fine production from the standpoint of crushing the gravels and stuff, but I thought that was pretty slick. So I want to make sure it's in. Oh, another one. Um, here is a pre-packed screen that basically is utilizing a ceramic bead type material. We have taken a lot of the oil and gas technology and tried to go and encompass that into a uh, pre-packed screen. I ran some of the very first pre-packs when I was working in the oil and gas industry, and we plugged them. They were inherently prone to plugging. Now that some of the advancements on pre-pack media is being based on ceramic beads, we're actually able to get around some of that. I'll send some of these around as well. Now, I should mention that there's a Macy's exploding ink pad in this, so if anybody tries to go... Uh, yeah, just one on both sides. The, the product that I'm sending around right now is a ceramic bead. It is a man-made material. And basically what it does is it gives us per, uh, really a, a perfected filter pack media. Right, don't open that. you really regret it. <laughs> um, it's a perfect uniform ceramic bead versus the natural uh, screen material, the, the Colorado silicas or some of the other higher silica materials we're talking about. But these particular ceramic beads just give us a great deal of enhancement from the standpoint of uniform filter media, and it's available anything in, in slots up to 50 thousandths, but it's taking a frac problem that was used in the oil and gas industry, using it as a filter media. And we don't recommend it from the standpoint of, of standard gravel pack because it's just so prohibitively expensive, but it's being utilized as a, that other corrupt, collaborated uh, screen before um, being utilized in a pre-pack type application. And again, what we're attempting to do is get a more uniform media filter pack and eliminate the needs for the trimmings, or eliminate the needs for the uh, excess uh, over drillage, over drilling of a borehole. We're actually able to go ahead and set in a smaller borehole, allow the formation to come in, and as we I like to argue, just set it and develop it. But these are some of the advancements in utilizing gravel media, ceramic beads that are filter medias now. Now, here's a um, quick rehab from the standpoint of the Fox Hills in, in Colorado where a completion comparison was done on a standard gravel pack versus that of a pre-pack. And you know, I won't bore you with it, you can come by later and we can talk about it, but it does come up to meeting the muster from the standpoint of being cost effective as well as giving you a much quicker completion and a much general um, enhanced completion. This has been utilized in a lot of different areas and a lot of different fields throughout the, the Southwest and we've had tremendous success with just this type of filter media. 
So again, we're talking about later and greater attempts to try to make sure that we're developing these wells out as best as possible. We want to make sure that our drilling cake and our, our uh, fluids that have invaded the formation we can get back out. We want to make sure that the delivered consolidation that's in is as thin as possible so we can pull it and we can get it out of the <coughs> well bore. Now here's something that's a rather interesting twist. I think most of you are probably familiar with expandable internal screen patches. Um, they're utilized where, in fact, you've got intervals that have failed or uh, applications where you need some type of uh, follow-up. This is typically about a 10-gauge material. It's run in and af after the hydraulic rams are pressed up against the ID of the existing well bore, you've now got a slight upset, but you now have a, uh, an improved um, ID or, or uh, well bore. Well, this is something that's the next elevation, and these are actually expandable screens. We're now looking at expandable liners. We're looking at expandable um, thin metal screens. This is something that uh, was published by Shell, and they're utilizing the same type of analogy that what you're getting from the standpoint of the angioplast in uh, heart applications are now being utilized in oil and gas applications as well. And basically, it's a technology to go ahead and run a slimmer hole, but being able to go ahead and selectively now run a series of, of um, trichome bits and, or excuse me, trichome expanders and expand out that screen into an application where we're now reaching the boundaries of being able to go deeper, but actually being able to go slimmer holes. So what you've got is a product that has a base pipe, base material that allows for the expansion, a twill or, or a woven material that basically affords us the sand protection, and then an outer screen right here that basically gives us the protection from the formation itself. This is what it looks like when, in fact, it's run into the well, and then once these tricone rollers are, are set in, and again, these are hydraulically brought in and brought out, so we can specifically take given intervals, expand that to a, a given diameter, pressing it against the formation, and since we're not developing the well, we've really done the very best we can from the skin and trying to facilitate the, um, the most prudent design possible. And it doesn't mean that we have to go ahead and swedge everything. We can go ahead and produce one interval, and once that interval, in fact, has proven out its, its uh, need, we can go back and abandon that interval and go back in with these and swedge yet again another. But this is what we're looking at after the swedging. And expandable lighters, again, if we've got a corroded area and something, we can go back in with some of these metal skins, very similar to the older style, but some elastic uh, polymers and stuff are being added in here so we do, in fact, have the best bond that we possibly can get across the interval. And here's something I thought was rather interesting from the standpoint of a lost circulation zone. If we do get into a situation where we're in lost circulation, now granted we have to utilize some fiber or some lost circulation type cements, but we can basically drill through. So we drill through an under ream, a given portion. We run our expandable down into that interval. We run back in and expand it across that interval. Then we go ahead and um, run back in with a cement and spot that cement across our interval. And by so doing, we're then able to go ahead and circulate that back out, clean it, and then run back in with green cement with a trichome bit and go through. But now we have actual casing up against our formation. We've got the confidence that we've now got an expandable cemented liner in across that lost circulation zone. So this may or may not be something of anyone's interest at this point in time, but these are some of the elevations. These are some of the advancements that are coming upon in the industry right now. And again, just as in our industry, lifting costs are supreme. Efficiency in the oil and gas industry, they watch their cost. There is a disconnect oftentimes from operators in the water well industry from the standpoint the guy who's the drilling uh, superintendent, the guy who's in fact having to go ahead and maintain that well, and then the guy who's on the accounting side and having to pay the electric bill are two, of the, are two unique and dis, distinct groups. In the oil and gas industry, they work much more closely together. They want to know their lifting costs. They want to know the efficiencies of those wells. So the selection of the sand screen is going to help with that efficiency. And the lifetime cost of the operation, this is something I would love to discuss later with anyone who wants to, to haggle it, but our argument is that the lifetime cost of operation exceeds the cost to complete a well. If we're looking at a 304 or 316 stainless steel completion, we're probably looking at a 50-year life on a well. If we're looking at a 50-year life with the cost and the promises of enhanced cost of operation, we are most likely looking at our operational cost, that is the electric bill, the lifting cost, to exceed that of whatever that well initially cost us. So looking at efficiency, I think, is paramount. And what we're trying to do, obviously, in either of the industries is affect and get the best hydraulic conductivity across our interval as possible. Increasing that conductivity basically means we're going to buy and uh, get ourselves a better completion for today as well as an eventual operation. 
Now here's a specialized tool that came from a contractor friend of mine, and he's had a great deal of success with it, and he gave me permission to share it. It makes perfect sense. So much of the time when we're in fact in the development phase, we're looking at a five foot interval from the standpoint of trying to do a development. At least in my neck of the woods, we're sometimes looking at a 100 to 200, 300 foot screen interval. That may be longer than what you're looking at. But it still takes some time, but we're still getting only the amount of energy that we're generating here in a five foot. In this particular tool, he's actually got the, the baffles set up, the swabs as we would regularly, but he's got a 5 eighths to 1 inch slot. He's producing a tremendous amount of pressure in this one little interval right here. He's getting on and off these wells in record time, and he's getting record production. So I throw this out as an interesting opportunity, as opposed to going to the, some of the lengths and stuff that we've been typically looking at from the five foot spacing on our swabs and jetting tools, minimizing that, making sure that we're centralized across that screen interval, but spending the time in a much shorter interval with much higher pressures, and we tend to be getting a lot better completions. So is he jetting out of that area? Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So. On the well development side, when do we know we're done? In this particular slide, this also came from Orange County. We thought we were in pretty good shape, but we ran a, a uh, mud dispersant. We ran a, a product that's available from Bearweight as well as from Johnson, and basically allowed it to sit for a period of time and came back and noticed that we did in fact have, and that's the proof of the pudding, we did in fact have a not so complete development from the standpoint of what we actually got back. So we want to spend the time, and basically just because the program says we're going to spend five hours developing a well, we want to develop that well until it comes up clean. And some of the, the uh, polymers, some of the, uh, excuse me, I should go and see, some of the polymers and the dispersants that are available today are very inexpensive in regards to some of the benefits that can be generated from well cleaning. Well maintenance is something that's on both sides of the fence. And again, some of these older wells that we get become plugged with biofilm or, sl or slime and our crustaceans and stuff can really impede what type of performance we're going to have. Unless we design a well that allows for periodic chemical treatments, and that is making sure that the well will not only handle the rigors of what we've established it to be, but the simple fact that the long-term long -term periodic maintenance is what's going to be critical. And we're going to have to make sure that we do everything we can to uh, make sure that stimulation is in that well's life and in that well's makeup. <coughs> Oftentimes we get asked what type of plugging actually are we up against, whether it's physical from the standpoint of clays, if we do a, a proper job developing. One of the biggest issues that I find in my neck of the woods is the fact if I've got a guy that says he's got a well that was drilled in the middle of a field and it's a dog, I'll ask him when it was drilled. If it was drilled during a drought, it's a pretty good indication that contractor didn't spend the time getting the physical, getting the actual plugging out of that well. There's probably no incentive for him to spend any longer on that well, so he pulled out. Running some of the non-phosphate dispersants will definitely go and enhance an awesome combination with chlorine, some of the opportunities for us to go and move forward in regards to cleaning up some of that. And the mineral precipitates, as well as the biological, are what we typically see as a combination of both. Downhole videos and fiber optics. Fiber optics are actually being run on casing and in liners in the oil and gas industry now. It is amazing in some of these long-reach horizontal wells where they're actually able to see the gas phase, the water phase, and the oil phase. There used to be a belief that they all were uniform. Well, we're actually seeing wave coming across now. Some of the fiber optics are now giving us downhole real-time uh, visuals on regards to the operation of these wells. And so we're now finding that not only with the advent of the downhole video camera, it gives us yet again another tool for diagnostic, but some of the smart wells, some of the fiber optics that are being hardwired in some of these wells today give us some of the opportunities. Um, this is a video that came from a, a well. If I was able to go ahead and get this to operate, we'd actually see this material not lying against the side of the casing in this particular situation, but actually out free floating in the well. It's a filter feeder. It's attracting its food, and it's actually throwing its waste out there. And it's amazing from the standpoint of what we actually witness in regards to how these wells operate and some of the dynamics when we get a video camera and get these wells running in a, a dynamic environment. And just as bacteria is prevalent in oil and gas as water well, we've done numerous studies on oil and gas injectors, and the exact same bacteria that we have in the oil and gas industry is plaguing us in the water well industry. Pseudomonas gallinilla. All of these are, are generated from various areas, whether it be aerobic or slime producing areas within the center of the well or the anaerobic environment, which is our sulfate or sulfur reducing, which basically gives us our H2S, our poor water quality, or in the case of a lot of uh, uh, tubulars, some of our high uh, corrosive environment. And again, any well, whether it be oil and gas or water well, we are now collaborating a great deal of elements that would never have been concentrated had we not been pulling them. So we find ourselves in a highly concentrated well environment where we start seeing some of the um, constituents, the calcium carbonates, the uh, irons and stuff, 
now joining together and producing some of the plugging mechanisms. And they're no different from the oil and gas industry as they are from the water industry. And so what we want to do is basically make sure that we get the dream, cleanest drilling fluids as a recap. We want to make sure that we get the best screen designs. We spend the sufficient time and multiple techniques to go ahead and get these wells cleaned up to give us the efficiencies that we're ultimately trying to look for. You know, biofouling and mineral scale is a challenge in any production well. We know for a fact that since we're accumulating these materials now, that the formation interface is going to be one place, but the formation gravel pack interface is probably one of our biggest challenges. We want to go back in with mechanical as well as chemical to make sure that we clean these things up as efficiently as possible. Now this is rather interesting from the standpoint, gallinilla is again a very common uh, iron accumulating bacteria. It is a challenge everywhere in the oil and gas industry as well as in the water well industry. These um, little critters, they themselves are not the problem. Their waste chain are the problems. They produce these filament um, chains and they become the real plugging element or the, the problem in regards to the operation of the well. But what they obviously uh, bruise is from their, their uh, time spent on steel. This is actually an example of a generated laboratory environment where I think it was less than one year we had the severe pitting and corrosion on 304 stainless steel simply from that gallinilla. So we start seeing microbial introduced corrosion that can tear us up not only on our pumps but also on our casings and our liners and such. So we've got to be evident of what type of bacteria is. And again, lab work is going to help us in that regard doing our preventive maintenance. And mineral scales and mineral formations are again an issue that we're constantly going to be battling with in any one of them. Whether or not we go in with a um, hydrochloric or a phosphoric acid solution, we're going to have to be looking at what type of formations. And again, laboratory analysis work is going to help us tremendously there. And from the standpoint of encrusting corrosion, we've got a situation where the bacteria is going to compound the issues of the mineral scale and the mineral deposition, where we find ourselves in a situation where it is not only going to go ahead and be a plugger, but it's also going to be a very aggressive um, destroyer of any of the iron that we've run down in the well. So I'm going to close with anticipating today and tomorrow and all of your well screen designs and completions. Consider the alternatives. Look over the fence. There is a whole world out there. Uh, membership to Society of Petroleum Engineers, I think, is $125 a year. That membership will now allow you to get online and take a look at any of the published papers that are out there. We've got a glossary for any subject matters and such. And it just gives us one more opportunity to differentiate ourselves from the industry, from that of our competitors, to give us the best leg up in regards to talking to our, our, um, our clients, to our customer, and ultimately trying to go and get the best possible job uh, available. We want to make sure that everything we run in that well is of the highest quality, ideally suited for the water chemistry, ideally suited for the environment, and knowing what we're looking at so we can then, de then get the best return on our investment and the best opportunity we've got to move forward. And with that, I'm going to open it up for some questions, and I thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE. They've got a, a great website in all of their papers. They've got some technical. If, you, if any of you work around environment, or if any of you work around oil fields, they have SPE chapters, which you can become members on, and some of the um, uh, distinguished speakers, very similar to the McElhaney, will give you open-end opportunities and such. I sat through a presentation a couple weeks ago that was talking about sand control and unconsolidated formations for water injection and water production. Ideally, or I see not say ideally, but identical problems of what we're fighting today in this industry. The same type of problems, the same type of issues. And it's interesting that cross-pollinization is now possible. They're looking at the water well industry from the standpoint of some of the bacteria, some of the lab work, some of the advancements that have been utilized in this industry that they can take over to their side of the fence. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The well lock uh, cards that you sent around, those available through Johnson? Yes, any of the um, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, they're all now utilizing those. You should be able to get them to the, to the state associations. And I believe that that's all online now. At least Oregon is supposed to be. Yep, that's all, that's all now available. So Tom Hanna, the author's in the back. You can go arm wrestle him. He'll help you out. Any other questions? Yes, Mary. You spoke of the product, the bentonite and the powder and the Wyoming is the, the Cadillac. There's numerous other bentonite sources. 
but Wyoming, simply because of the geology that it was set down in the volcanic and some of the calcium that's available to it, has basic, I think it's calcium, but it's the, uh, the Wyoming, uh, bentonite is the premium, sodium, thanks God, the, the, um, is a premier. There are other grades that are available, but because of those grades don't match the rheology and some of the other, um, real, some of the other um, makeups of the Wyoming bentonite, the polymers are added into it. So Wyoming is considered the, the paramount, and very little, if any, additives that we've ever witnessed in the laboratory have been benefited. But some of the other polymers, or excuse me, some of the other bentonites that are out there and available, those particular products are benefited. There are polymers being added to those. And that's where you have to chlorinate, not for disinfection, but to simply break back those polyacrylamides, those added polymers. Have you had any dealing with any from Texas? Yes. Yeah, primarily Texas is, Texas is, is one of the sources of that other uh, bentonite, right, which, which are then benefited. We just so. had that question arise, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to chlorinate. We've got, we've got guidelines you wish to come by the booth. We can go ahead and set you up with some guidelines on about how to chlorinate those wells just to basically knock back that um, 2 to 4% polyacrylamide that's now added into those, uh, those other polymers. Those, gosh, excuse me, those other bentonites. I apologize. Yes, sir. Uh, you, a, a lot of what you're talking about is going to have to wait for the economics of water to catch up with the economics of oil, but... The expandable casing and the expandable screen look like something that might be directly applicable now to recovering failed wells. And a lot of my clients are much more willing to spend money when it's going to keep them from having to drill a new well, especially with the deeper sets. Uh, is there much experience in using the expandable screen, particularly in, in uh, the water well industry? No. The expandable screens have primarily been used in Gulf of Mexico and a lot of the um, African um, uh, oil and gas operations. I don't know of a single application yet, but one of my chores is today is to get that information out so we can, in fact, do it. Well, it's what all, kind of cost per foot does an expandable screen, say an 8-inch? It has, it has everything to do with economics and what type of expansive. I honestly don't have an answer to that. The gentleman's question is, is true from the standpoint of anything, from the standpoint it has to make sense economically. But what we're trying to go and emphasize today is that we're, look, we're looking into a bag of tricks that oftentimes doesn't have many other solutions or options. We've got to be able to go and take a look at whether the options are out there. And as some of these expandable screens, as the coil tubing, as some of these other materials become much more readily available, then we're looking at the circumstances where the economics will, in fact, come into play. Um, in the case of a well completion in Southern California, it's over a million and a half dollars now to complete a 16-inch produ production well. So folks are willing to spend the money up front to get that longevity because they don't think they're going to be able to get back to work on some of these wells. They're not going to get the permits. So economics is absolutely what it's all about. I'm trying to make sure that everybody knows that there are, in fact, opportunities out there. And if we haven't had anything else, then we can reach, reach into our bag of tricks and pull something else out new. So point will take. Questions? Yes. That's you correct. You also mentioned that you were able to identify the location of, a, I'm understanding, a casing type failure. A contract, yeah, the, the question is how do you know that these 12.5% variances are in fact in principle being utilized? Well, a contractor in uh, the Southwest was doing a cement job and he had not taken into consideration the fill up and the, the uh, reduction in wall and so he failed. He had a catastrophic failure, collapsed the screen on his um, on as well, excuse me, collapsed the casing on as well. We went back and followed up, and in fact, we were able to go and figure out exactly, and I think I was within 10 feet of where that collapse was. And this particular contractor was unaware of this wall variance thickness. At another circumstance with another collapse about a year and a half ago, contractor called up and said he wanted a quarter inch wall 304 stainless steel, and I said I wasn't willing to sell it to him. I would only go into a 375 wall for insurance purposes. He didn't question. He said, I can get it less expensively. He went up on it and got it. Two weeks later, he called me back up. He said, now, why exactly didn't you want to sell me the quarter inch? And sure enough, it collapsed on him. And I indicated that, you know, this is, a, it is not a dirty little secret. It's just a secret. It is, in fact, a variance that is allowable in the specifications right now. So what you see published is, in fact, not truly what you're actually purchasing. So you have to take that in consideration for any calculations, especially if you're pushing the envelope on any of the larger diameter, 8 inch and above. You definitely want to take that wall variance thickness in consideration. And it's an issue on threading. If any of you are trying to go and thread column pipe and you're working with standard pipe, 
your threading is going to be vastly affected from the standpoint of that variance. So threads and collapse strengths all fall into that variance that is, in fact, uh, allowable at this point in the industry. I was just curious about it. I'm from Wisconsin, and our code specifies, um, you know, thickness of casing pipe, and I'm not sure that it takes into consideration that. I know folks that are actually, I mean, again, this was a hard-learned uh, lesson from Johnson Screens many, many years ago, but the simple fact is a lot of folks that are representing and wholesalers of pipe aren't aware of it either, so... Yes, sir. That's a answer to a mysterious question that we've had for a long time about our packers. Why our standard packers that you know we've stocked and used will some of them are tight fitting and some of them are not tight fitting. Some of them pass sand. You know, once you start developing a screen and you start getting material. Looking at, you know, yeah, the, the OD, the outside diameter won't be effective, but the ID would be. So from the standpoint of setting the packer, you're saying you may not get an absolute set across the ID of that. Well, yeah, <coughs> if there's, if there's a, that much variance in pipe, sometimes, sometimes when we're setting a screen and developing, we'll be getting material that we know is not coming through that screen. And it's caused us in the past to set up wing stabilizer center to center our packers um, because we did not want to push them one way or the other. Things are that that critical, um, and sometimes on the odd occasion you'll have one that passes a lot of sand. Yeah. Well, I think the issue is not only from an ID and dimensional, but also from a threading. I think we have a lot of thread failures that we may or may not be properly diagnosing simply because the thread was cut on what we thought was a nominal wall, and that nominal wall is probably 10 or 12.5% less than. So, any other questions? I'm accepting answers, too. I'd like answers. <laughs> Thank you again very, very much. I do appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. 